Mixed day for stocks. We had the jolts data and now good news is now bad news. And that's something we're going to have to discuss and understand exactly what happened. Why Jamie Dimon made the comments that he made. Are we holding key levels? It sure seems that way. What kind of rotation did we see today? And we actually saw a lot of rotation into different technology sectors, which we're going to discuss. We're also seeing the regional banks being weak. We're going to discuss why they're going to be weak. And we are seeing two very specific indicators that are causing confusion, but are giving glaring signals about what is to come next. We had a massive move in gold today, and we're going to explain why that is happening. Let's get to it. Very clearly, you are making higher lows as you move up. The idea that we're going to see the October lows again, to me, uh, is pretty delusional at this point. So you would have mixed six months of gains waiting for something to happen. So that's not really what we do here. What we do here is analyze the data and then look for a way to benefit and profit from it. So we don't make outrageous claims that we're going to take out the lows. The market is not going to crash every single day, and it's also not going to melt up every single day. You're in what's called a stage one base. It's very, very clear that you are basing here and you've been in the same exact base since May. All you're doing is rotating. That's all you've been doing. But the beauty of it is it's getting tighter and tighter. So it's going to pick a direction. You could come in on bad financial news. That seems like that would be the reason. Or we could break out, which seems to be the way that we're leaning. But we're going to get into that. But to start with, you need to watch this 4200 level. That's becoming increasingly clear. For us, it's between 4170 and 4200. That's where we start to really run into the issues. And that's really our range. So that's what I'm focused on there. Now, if you look at today's bar, it was the first lower low that we had. And if you watched us on Saturday, and I would make sure that you follow the videos because they do go in succession as the market is dynamic, it is not static, meaning it's not the same thing every day. You see these levels right up here I've marked in red. Well, we marked these off on Saturday and we just very simply stated that every time that you get up to a 96, you start getting to a point, actually over a 90, you start getting to a point where you're going to see some selling off, some pullbacks. And this is S&P stocks above the five day moving average. That does not mean the sky is falling. It just means that you are more prone to a sell off because the majority of stocks may be a little overextended. That's all it means. If you drill into the larger frame, stocks are currently above the 50 day moving average by 50%. If you go and mark these levels and you look at every single time that we have had a bottom and pushed, it's right when we flipped that 50%. We tried to do it here and we failed. And obviously you can see where the peak of the market was, right? So as the market was getting ready to peak in here and you can see how we were hitting lower lows on the 50 day. You can see that right here. So this is the 50 day right up. And so what I'm getting at is as we peaked in the market, we were still going higher on the S&P, but you see how we were kind of coming down on the percentages. You're going higher on the percentages. You're over the 50 line. And if you mark any of these, you will see something extremely glaring. You will see that this is usually when you have the single greatest move. And that works until it doesn't work, until you get to a level where you then sell off because you're there, right? Very similar as to when you get to four. If you go take at the lows of the market, when you get to four, you'll see a massive low. It's very, very rare to get to these levels and see these extremes, but we are in extreme time. Now, stocks above the 200 day moving average. When you get above that 50 line, this you can see was November 2022. You can see right when that happened. And you can see it again here in January. If you go and take a look at the market, these were some of the greatest moves that you've had in the S&P during the past 12 months. You can see how we're starting to do that here as well. Now, if I put the orange line in above, which is the S&P, and you can see how we have those dates marked, you can see the green arrows are just denoting exactly where the S&P was during that period of time. And you guessed it, you're right there right now. Now, does that mean we're going to have the same great move? I'm going to tell you what everybody should be telling you. We have absolutely no idea. But you have a channel and that channel is pushing higher. That and that alone is enough to get me out of my chicken little that the sky is falling and the great recession is coming and it's going to be worse than any other recession. Is it? I have absolutely no idea. And I can tell you this, nobody does because we, they would have said that the banks were going to have a problem and we're going to address that. And they didn't, did they? So here we are again, and we're trying to predict what's going to happen. Let's analyze what's actually happening. The index is actually making lower highs. 
the breadth of the market is getting stronger. It's just indicated by percentage of stocks above the 250. And, and obviously the five is so overheated that we need a little bit of a pullback. I, I think it's silly to think that you're just going to go up every day. You are not in a runaway market. You're in a stage one and the market's been basing and you're in the same base since you've been since May. So if we know that, then how do we make money? It's a trader's market. We must trade stocks. Now, one of the most glaring indicators that I have used is this risk on risk off indicator. And this is just so obvious. But what you're seeing is every time that you're up, that means that they're putting risk on when it goes black and risk off means that they are selling. Just think net sellers, net buyers. That's the easiest way to do it. Think, think of it across institutions, retail, everybody. And all we're doing is giving a five year snapshot. We can take that to a 10 and you can take a look at it. And we can see what I think is very, very obvious. In 10 years, you've never had so much risk off. And I'm gonna explain why that's substantial. And I wanna show you here, and you can see in June how much risk was off over 10 years. Let's go out on 15 so that you can see it and how far down you would actually have to go to even get there. And you don't even have that during the great, uh, during the great financial crisis. Let's go out 20. Okay, and then you can start seeing it, how low it actually is, right? Now, let's zoom out on this so that you can really see that level. And look at where you are here in the zero line, all the way down here. Even during levels where we had the dot-com blow up, we had the great financial crisis, you had more risk aversion here and less risk on up here than you have had through 20 years of looking at this data. This is actually, I clicked all the data. Now, why is that substantial that we are down here with very little risk on and right down here, we have the lowest risk off. And I'll tell you why it's substantial. It's substantial because when they decide and they will decide that they are out of position and they need to increase their risk, meaning put risk on, risk on is buying stocks. Think of it or buying asset classes, right? It could be high yield bonds, doesn't matter. When they go out there and they buy and they put on risk, any asset class, they're out of position already. And they've been historically out of position for the past two years. And the reason that that's important is because they're going to have to buy. It is estimated that the net short positions across the market are the lowest that they've been in decades. And what that's telling you is that people are scared. And I'm not saying they shouldn't be of some things that are out there, but when it turns, and spoiler alert, for the past hundred years, it always turns. If you see this, you have to start paying attention to these moves. Now, is this the spot to buy because of this? Well, that's going to remain to be seen. And we're going to dig into a couple other charts here that are going to explain that before we get into some ideas. But that's a pretty clear indication on what's going on here. That's already predicted the peak of this level in February, which was our high. This is predicted the peak in the August, September level, which was a high. You can see in here as well. So I want to watch how I act in here but I always wanna be cognizant of one very glaring fact, that this is some of the lowest levels of risk that institutions have taken in about 20 years. We have not seen this since the pandemic. And even then, that was just the risk off that you were, that you were somewhat close. You even have less risk off here, but look at the gap in risk on. You don't have anything like this. So I think that's pretty important. Now you had a lot of risk off during the great financial crisis, but not like this, not where historically for like two years now, you're going into almost two years of this, where you're just very, very little risk on. And you can see that, and this is pretty important. So I just wanna spend a moment to showing you that line. So you can just kind of see that line on where that top is. And you can see the only other time that this has really happened was right here. And during that time, it wasn't even for as long of a period of time as this is. And I think that is pretty substantial. Now, if we take a look at the NASDAQ, and I think this is where the risk on is actually gonna go, and I'm gonna show you the three top sectors in a moment here. See how the 200 day is starting to curl up? It's very, something that I would not bet against. I would not bet against a curling up 200 day moving average. Again, if you did not buy in October or you're waiting for the lows, you missed it. And you're gonna have to deal with that, or you're gonna be one of these people that are on social media that are gonna be a bear for the rest of their lives talking about gold and putting money under the mattress. So here you are going sideways, 
and you're forming a flag. I have a doji, I broke above that doji, and then I went sideways. A lot of today's action was based upon Jamie Diamond and his comments, which we're gonna address in a minute. But let's just drill into this just a little bit deeper because there's a couple things here that I think are worth discussing. You wanna watch this 13,000 level. I have it really marked off very, very thick lines because there's a lot of moves here. This is major support now. This is the level that we couldn't get through that all of a sudden we're now getting through and you can see how it's marked and denoted. And this is our resistance up here, 13.7. So you're really in no man's land right here and we're gonna have to watch that level. But this is what you wanna watch. Now I'll show you what I think is gonna drive us. I think XLC is gonna be one of the big drivers and this is communication uh, services. Now I think we're gonna see more of a driver in XLC than we normally do. At this stage in the cycle, and the one thing that we can all agree on, and if we can't, then we can't, but the one thing we should be able to agree on is that rate hikes are near the end, not near the beginning. So whether you think they raise in May or they raise in June, it's immaterial. The bottom line is no one has them going any higher. That doesn't mean that they don't, but right now this is what we have. And if this is what we have, then that's what we trade off of. And that means that in this part of the economic cycle, you buy XLC, you buy XLK, you buy XLF. The issue with XLF is that nobody trusts them right now. Now, today, Jamie Dimon came out and said some statements about uh, the regional banking crisis. So he's coming out saying that he sees this crisis going on for years and years and years. Uh, it must be nice to be able to talk about your competitors like that, but here he is just bashing those banks and everyone's panicking and they're listening to him. So you're watching us battle this level and I'm just showing a four hour chart here so that you can see these levels a little clearer, but I think this, this is pretty significant. So if we don't go out there and have three sectors that people are comfortable buying and they are not comfortable buying here, right? And we know they're not comfortable buying here. So then we can go out there and take a look at the rest of the market and go, well, what other areas are they going to go into? Well, they're going to buy energy, right? Because OPEC cut. Well, that party lasted for less than 24 hours before we're probably going to gap fill, right? We actually discussed that in yesterday's video on why this was going to be short lived. I actually mentioned yesterday that I was trying this drip trade, trying to pick off the bottom down here. But it may have worked today, but I got out yesterday or the day before. Yep, yesterday, actually. Today's Tuesday. So I actually got out and just didn't work. Just moved on to the next one. But I can't see where else the money's going to go. So then you'd start diving into it and go, well, if it go, it's going to go into communication services. If it's going to go into tech and that's where it's going to go, maybe it's going to go into expanded tech as well. And then you start looking at this. Well, that looks that pattern looks really familiar. And maybe we can see if we can see that pattern somewhere else. And then you drill into this and you start seeing that pattern here in the NASDAQ. So we have IGV that looks ready like it's going to break out. We have the SOX. You're still riding that level and unable to break it. So people are getting a little panicky there, but I do think that it's going to be okay. You have XLK that is clearly forming a flag up here. You have XLC which has a cup and here's your handle and you're breaking out and you're heading towards our levels. Now, let's take a look at a, a, just one other glaring indicator. In front of us is the NASDAQ divided by the SPY. So this shows NASDAQ performance relative to the SPY. And you can see since 2023, it has been on an absolute tear with the NASDAQ grossly outperforming. You can actually measure the outperformance if you take that low and just go to that high and see that you have 15 percentage points of outperformance in the NASDAQ versus the S&P from trough to peak. Obviously, that's not where you are right now, but that's where we're at. So why is this level important? I'm glad you asked. See how we're riding this line? If we flip this line, and it is my belief that we're going to flip this line, we're not coming up. You're not forming this rising wedge. You're forming an enormous flag. And that enormous flag started in March. And now you're just sitting at a key level. That's all you're doing. These are not flags that usually break down and just start rolling. You can see how the 200 starting to curl up. I would not bet against that either. But when you have a stronger market, this is what happens. The issue that you're dealing with right now is that the regional bank crisis is not going away. And we're just trying to pretend that it's either not there or we're pretending that th this is not an issue. Uh, and it is an issue and it needs to be addressed. And I'm not really sure what the game plan is here, but it's not realistic for these just to stay in that level. Now, thankfully, this was the close 
right in here. And we are, we did not make a lower low close, which I'm very happy about. But if you're looking at that, uh, you can't really feel warm and fuzzy about the regional banks. You start drilling into the regional banks and there's no bounce here. There's, there's nothing. They're just, they're just dead money. And we're just pretending that everything's okay. Well, it's, it's pretty clear that everything is not okay. And I think that that is where the frustration is really coming in with people. Um, and I think it's making them a little more skittish. And I think that's adding to a couple things. But I look at this and you know this is paying 16%. They, they had the opportunity to do a secondary and they said, no, not at these levels. And I've got a preferred here trading as if it's a junk bond. So I think that there's a huge disconnect in the market. And we're even seeing that here. Now I'm watching Schwab, who has come out very clearly and said that they have more than enough assets, that they are completely fine. And we thought we were going to get that bounce through 60. And now we have a new closing low. So whether we have a crisis in confidence, whether it's not being explained properly, it doesn't matter whether it's a real issue or not. Until this resolves itself, you're not going to see money flow into that. But you're not going to watch all these indicators going off and not see people put money to work. That's why people are buying XLK. And that's why these names where people are saying, oh, they can't possibly go higher. You haven't seen anything. You haven't seen anything until you start seeing people try to chase performance. This is these kinds of moves. This is nothing. This is the beginning of what could be a massive move in these kinds of names. And the reason is because there's only so many sectors that people are going to be comfortable with. Goldman calls them long duration names. And what they are, it's high growth, high margin. Okay? You don't want to be playing with thin margin names, especially when you have the, the rates doing what they're doing right now. But you want to look at those kinds of names that have growth. Jolt's jobs number comes in at 10 million, under 10 million. We were looking for 10.4. All of a sudden, that's bad news. Now, I don't think it's bad news, but here we are. Look where you are, 3.30, 3.34 on the 10-year. Okay, so I've got the 10-year. I've got equities, right? Should be rallying, but they're not really because we're getting skittish for a couple of reasons. Uh, and I'm not saying that there's not an issue, the XLF, the, and especially KRA, it needs to be addressed. But they're buying bonds. They're not buying bonds because they think that they're going to keep raising rates. Okay, so they're buying bonds. They're selling the dollar. We talked about this dollar and we talked about this cross a couple of months ago and how we were not going to get above the 200 when everyone was calling for the dollar to hit highs, right? Very simple technical analysis. Just look up death cross and golden cross. It will save you a lot of heartache. So if you look at the dollar, you look at the 10 year, right? And then you go, okay, well, we, so we know where we are with the market in, in and of itself. Well, where's the money going, right? So here's gold, that's where the money's going. So we've been buying gold since I think 80, 81, right down here, we bought it in the newsletter. If you don't get the newsletter, there's a link in description uh, and you're going to want to get it, it's free. Uh, and you can follow along with what we do in the Alpha Chasers community. So I would suggest that you get it, but we're heading to highs. People want safety. I also tell you the next thing that I think is going to move as people fly to safety. I think Bitcoin's gonna break out here. I think we're forming an enormous flag. And if you take a look at this flag on Bitcoin, watch this, because I found this fascinating in doing my comparisons. Look how that flag matches the NASDAQ's outperformance of the S&P. It's almost like looking in a mirror. Now, before we go any further, this is the S&P is enjoying one of the best buy the dip reactions in 2023. This is going to chart the amount of buying the dip on the way down. And what's fascinating about this is this goes back 100 years. Okay, you're going back 100 years where they charted this. This is Sediment Trader. It's actually a pretty good product. There's a lot of data in here, but I, I like crunching data. But if you look at these levels, and you start trying to figure out where they fit in. Well, it's it's absolutely fascinating to me uh, when you see these levels that are in here. Forget these dates down here because that's picking up that calendar. Look at these dates, right? And you can kind of see where you're at right in here. So I, right around that 98 level, I mean, I just find that really interesting. That was long-term capital and they bought the dip, right? You're kind of around the same level as long-term capital. I point that out because one of the newsletters I point out is, is this Lehman Brothers? or is this long-term capital? Well, they're buying the dip as if it's long-term capital. So the question is, how much pain is actually out there in the regional banks? Now, bottom line is nobody has any idea. I can show you this DTL right here on BNKD. I found this interesting, how you're holding that DTL right in here, downward trend line, and look at how you're flipping right here. So you're holding above the 200 day, which is interesting. 
I do like that you're holding that if you're interested in trying to play this, I'm just gonna show you the volume is still way off. And when I read all the research reports, and I read a lot of research reports, all I see is them talking about how great things are in regards to the slow down of withdrawals uh, out of these regional banks. I have to be honest, I don't know who's got their money in a regional bank right now that feels comfortable with the amount of silence that's going on right now. But I'm looking at this and we're trying to hold in that area. I just feel that people might be playing this waiting for some kind of catastrophic event that just never shows up and it becomes a slow bleed and maybe we lose another bank or two. I, the the one that I think we're going to lose is I think FRC is has some kind of major issue. It just it cannot get up off the ground and JP Morgan cannot get through 130. So every time it gets through 130 it just rejects. So to me I think that they're going to be the ones like the quote that they're going to merge with it in some way uh, or be a strategic partner in some way is what I think we're going to see. And they have no problem finding buyers. If you remember uh, that this just happened the other day with uh, First Citizens Bank shares and they came out and now you're at all time highs. So. I mean, they'll find banks that are going to do this. So maybe it's not going to be JP Morgan. Maybe it's going to be some other bank. Uh, and so I do think that you could see another one of these banks go under. And I think that that's what the market's telling you to some extent. And I think that's forcing everybody again into the XLC trade. Um, NYCB is the NYCB was the other one that was allowed to buy assets. And you can see how that's acting. You're hanging in here. You're not really falling apart but you're not really lighting the world on fire either. So I still think there's an issue with the regionals, but there's too many there's too many glaring signs that this market is going to push itself higher. At a minimum, it's gonna pull back and then just set up again. It might take a little bit longer because of OPEC and this regional banking crisis. Now in front of us is just price momentum. Let's click this off so that people aren't distracted. Oops, step back, okay. In front of us is the price momentum cycles from bearish to bullish. This is giving you a deviation in trend on a four week average price of the NASDAQ 100 divided by the 40 week price of the NASDAQ 100. Deviation from trend is calculated by a four week average divided by a 40 week average, right? Take the short distance, divide it by the long distance. When you go under from under 0.93 to greater than 104, which you are doing right here in that range. And you can see the amount of times that you've been this low since the 80s. You've only been down this level a couple times. Once you get back over this level, this 104 level is what they're talking about. That is when the signal kicks in. And that signal from this low is 100% that the S&P will be higher and that the NASDAQ will be higher within a period of 12 months. Now, there's no guarantee that you're going straight up. You could bounce around a lot. And these indicators work until they don't. From a statistical standpoint, you need 30 data points for it to be statistically significant. I don't have 30 data points. All I have is this. So that's what I'm going off of. And in looking at it, I can see what they're talking about. It's that shift of extreme negative movement, like we're seeing with the risk off to risk on, and then they realize that they're wrong. I think that's what we're starting to see. I'll give you a great example. This is WWE and they're merging with EDR Endeavor. All right, so they're gonna merge. And it's gonna be one company under a new symbol. EDR will be in control. They will own 51%. They have an $11 billion market cap. WWE has a roughly $7.8 billion market cap and it's gonna get 49%. From the closing price yesterday, I'm gonna clean this off for a moment here. From the closing price yesterday, they were getting a 30% premium roughly. Stock went down, okay? You have so much confusion going on at investment banks that they don't know what's going on. It was actually even confusing to me why the stock was down. You're seeing a lot of disconnects out there in the market and that leads to opportunity, risk on, risk off. And we're seeing that opportunity now. If we're seeing mergers like this and we're seeing Baba go out there and say, by the way, 12 to 18 months from now, uh, we're going to spin off you know, six different companies in an IPO, that's something to pay attention to. But when you start seeing disconnects like this, where you have a stock that we bought in the Alpha Chasers community in like the mid 80s, that all of a sudden is pushing up, you have so much confusion 
that they're missing a 30% move. You know, from that move on, we caught 17% of it already. And you know, you'll have a discount to the merger goes through, but this was just absolute insanity. Seeing this APLS bid up, you're at 79.6 after hours. This is something we bought as well. And the reason I'm bringing it up is pharmaceutical companies do not try to outbid each other in times of uncertainty. They're trying to outbid each other for this company because they're putting themselves in a position where it's better for them to do this than to have cash. And you're seeing that. And I think that this is the kind of thing that's going to continue. Do I think every tech stock is going to go up? No, I think that that is not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is that far and few between, just like everyone today is predicting the great uh, decline of Tesla. And frankly, I was short Tesla today and did quite well with it for the day. But you have these down two days and then when they if it does something wonky and then it reverses and heads back up and maybe it's not going to do that right now because you have this trend line right here and you can see how you broke that maybe it's not going to do that because you're going to have the outliners like tesla that never get above that 200 day for a very long period of time right remember earlier we said 50 percent were above the 200 day and that is not so that means you go and look for the ones that are okay, nvidia okay so it didn't hit a new high today so this is what I'm saying. This is where the money's going. And you have so much disconnect right now that they are pouring money into gold because they are confused. It's not because you're going into a recession. You don't buy gold because you're going into a recession. You buy gold because of uncertainty. And you have so much uncertainty right now that it's staggering. It's also why I think that you could see a bigger, a much, much bigger move in Bitcoin because Quite frankly, people don't like playing stocks and, th and they get their risk on by buying Bitcoin. So I hope that was helpful. Please comment on the video. It helps greatly in creating content. Have a great evening.